start, I just want to be focused. We started three years ago having a conversation about the rules. Actually, John, I think you were here for, I think, that possibly that thinking too. And, and the idea, if you've not been to a, our newsroom before, the idea of Tortoise was really to see if you could open up the newsroom and have a conversation about some of the big issues driving the news and operate as I did in a former life, whether it was the BBC or the FT or the Times, and have an editorial meeting. By which we mean, let's have everyone in the room weigh in where and when they want to on their point of view. And today, we're going to do that in the service of a particularly big idea that's been with us really from the start, which is the question of the rules that govern our country, or if you like, the absence of rules <laughs> that fail to govern our country. Now, I want to start with a, uh, a thank you to all of you for coming and an apology, because it turns out not everyone who breaks the rules is an MP. So I'm responsible for breaking the rules of our own thinking, which is that all thinking should be equally women and men. And we have failed before we've even started, right? And I want to apologise for it. I want to tell you why it matters so much, right? It matters because the purpose of having a newsroom that's open is that you're going to have different and contesting points of view. And even if you have fundamentally different voices, if you have the perception of a particular group of people at the front of a room, it's impossible to believe that there is an openness to those contested voices. So it matters to us not just in the substance of what we say, but in the openness to what other people will say, and it's a, it's a fail, right? I say that because I'm quite hungry for a world in which a few more people said, I'm sorry, so I'm starting with my own, I'm sorry. That said, I hope that it won't hold you back because throughout this room and throughout the set of conversations we're set to have over the coming months, we hope we're going to hear from people who have fundamentally different political convictions, some we really hope constructive suggestions on how we might mend our democracy. The beauty, I should say, of being an editor is that you can listen and hear a range of great ideas, some of them zany, some of them a little airy, but some of them that we really hope that at the end of this process we might get behind. And we start with a real openness in this because we genuinely don't know what they are. We're not a political party. We are, at best, a newsroom with drinks. So we hope that we will be able to get behind a few ideas and we'd love to hear from you. Just to let you know how the thing works, we're going to try and hear from people in the room throughout the course of things. So it's not like a panel thing where, you know, like, OK, let's sit, possibly screen through, do a couple of emails, wait for a Q&A in the last 10 minutes. That's not the way the thing works. The thing works because whenever you want to, just literally catch my eye, and there are a whole bunch of people online, we'll make sure we bring those people in, and let's get stuck into the, to the conversation. Today, before we sort of go more broadly, I'm going to ask Joe, who... I'm imagining almost singularly, Joe, has been around and spoken to 10,000 separate British citizens <laughs> to ask them. So if you may know, today we launched uh, the findings of Tortoise's Democracy in Britain poll. And the reason for it was that we came into the new year, we were trying to think, what do we do at a time when politics is obviously so unstable? And what does a slow newsroom do that's different from chasing every twist and turn, every process story in Westminster? And we thought we could begin to get at what people in Britain really think about the state of democracy. And Peter Kellner, the pollster, helped us figure this out, helped us work up questions. Joe at Delta Poll and the team helped us go through focus groups to identify what questions would really land. And then we put those questions into the public domain. 10,000 people is actually a boast on our part. That's a very large sample size. And we did that for a reason, because we wanted to be able to cut it as many ways as possible, geographically, by age, by uh, a whole bunch of things that Joe's going to get into in a moment. But Joe, why don't you sort of help us, if you like, frame the conversation we might have, or at least give us some food for thought. What did you think, you've done a lot of polling, what did you think were the key findings, the things that either surprised you or we think the things should direct our thinking about democracy? 
thank you, James, and, and thank you to everyone for attending. I'm Joe Twyman, and I'm the co-founder of the Public Opinion Consultancy Delta Poll. And over the last two decades, I've had the privilege of asking questions about democracy on a number of different occasions. From 2007 to 2010, I was asking more than 5,000 people uh, surveys, uh, questions about democracy every month. Uh, and that was for the United Nations Development Program, uh, looking at the nature of democracy, what people thought of democracy and what the future held for democracy. And at the time, I was based in Baghdad, working in Iraq, conducting surveys of the Iraqi population to investigate on behalf of the United Nations what they thought of democracy. And I thought about those results as I was looking through these results, because Back in 2007 to 2010, I would look at results and think, oh, dear, what a mess. What a disaster. Where do things go from here? <laughs> and one thing that came through very clearly back in 2007 uh, was the desire that so many people had in Iraq for a strong leader, the strong man. And it was really a man that they were, uh, that they were looking for. Uh, the idea that that was the solution to the myriad of problems that different groups within Iraqi society faced. And what struck me about those, these results now, all these years later, and in a very different country, was how that came through again. Now, unlike Iraq, it's not the case that a majority of people in this country do think that a strong man is the answer. At the same time, it is not the case that nobody thinks that. Indeed, nearly a third of respondents in our survey felt that the strong man, although actually technically we asked about strong leader, but I imagine they mean man, a strong leader was the answer. Now, 60% of people thought otherwise. That's only 60% thought that it was dangerous to give too much power to specific leaders and that parliament should play its role. Only six out of 10, 9% of people, further 9% said they didn't know. And why was that? Well, there are lots of explanations. The data set is enormous and I urge you all to look through it in detail. But ultimately we were asking about satisfaction with democracy. And when we looked at that, it provided an insight into perhaps why the strong leader is favoured by so many millions of people. When we ask people, leaving aside the issue of whether you support or oppose Britain's present government, how democratic do you think Britain's political system is these days? 52% of people said very or fairly democratic. 52% said very or fairly democratic. Just over half. Over a third, just over a third, 34% said not very or not at all demographic, demographic, sorry, mm -hmm. democratic. And what groups believe that democracy is doing well? Well, conservatives, the over 65s, those who are financially secure, ABC1 social grades, those that voted to leave the EU, or a majority of all of those think that British, the British political system is democratic. But what about those at the other end of the spectrum? Labour voters, just 46% of them think it is very or fairly democratic. C2DEs, 32 to 54 year olds, Liberal Democrat voters, 25 to 34 year olds, Remain voters, all of those, either a half or fewer than a half, think that Britain's political system is very or fairly democratic. And among both groups, when asked for their top three words to describe their feelings about the way British democracy works, the top three were uneasy, disgusted and angry. The bottom three, confident, happy, and proud. Now, the strong leader argument is one symptom of this wider problem. Similarly, uh, there are explanations in the degree to which people feel MPs represent their own interests as opposed to constituents. There are issues around 
whether people feel that MPs are normal people, and so on and so forth, uh, whether they believe that local democracy or national democracy is best. There are lots of ways of looking at this. But I won't go into all the detail now because I know that we, uh, we don't have all night. So instead, I will just say that that top-line finding, I think, is pause for thought, at the very least, cause for concern, perhaps. But what it can't be is just an excuse for complacency. Because I'm not suggesting that we're going to plunge into the kind of democratic deficit that they had in Iraq back at the end of the 2000s. But it demonstrates that the liberal democracy that has brought peace and harmony to this country for many centuries perhaps cannot be taken as for granted as we had perhaps thought. Joe, thank you. I'm, I'm going I'm to put into the room what you said about the state of leadership, the state of respect for parliament, the state of our democracy in a slightly obtuse way, if you'll allow me, which is imagine everyone that your best friend comes to you and says, I've been thinking about what to do with my life and I've had a change of gear. I think I'm going to run to be a member of parliament. How many people here say to your best friend, good idea? Hands up. And how many people here say, not on your life? Not on your life. Who, 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 would, who wants to give a, do you want to say why not on your life? Um, I think just because they'd be eaten alive. Eaten alive by, by? By the public, oh sorry. Um, they'd be eaten alive by the public, but also just by the way that women generally, women MPs are treated by the public versus male MPs. Diane Abbott, for example, and Theresa May. Um, and also, yeah, because you know, it's a man's world, I suppose. And I just don't know how much change my best friend specifically, because that's who I was thinking, like this one person I have in mind, <laughs> would be able to make in Parliament. Uh, it just, just not see, it doesn't seem like her kind of thing. So, right. yeah. Who else is not in your life? Yeah, John. I guess uh, because I th I'm not convinced that working that going into that system as it currently is is. Uh, so, John, will you introduce yourself? I should remember. I should have. Everyone, when you get the mic, will you introduce yourself? Because if you're watching at home, people will know who you are. Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> uh, I'm John Alexander. I'm, I recently wrote a book called Citizens: Why the Key to Fixing Everything Is All of Us, which is very unambitious uh, <laughs> in its scope. Um, so, yeah. So, my, I guess my take, and, and I'm, I was toying with this myself. Like, it, but, but I think where I'm at right now is, I, I think that it's sort of related to what you're saying. I think that the, the, the structures and processes are so flawed. Uh, of Parliament in particular. Uh, Parliament in particular, the the, the broader system. I, the, I don't want to go off on a big one, but the, 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 I, I, in the book, I, I, for the research for the book, I studied very closely what's happened in Taiwan over the last decade, and I think there's an incredibly positive, incredibly exciting kind of political revolution that's taken place there, but that really started outside the system uh, with a with originally a hacker movement called Gov Zero. Uh, kind of inventing a different relationship between citizen and state and making that tangible and 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 then essentially challenging the existing system to evolve into it. I, I guess I'm maybe without without occupying taking up too much ox oxygen in this moment but the, the I think my theory of change would be closer to the Buckminster Fuller idea that you, you never change things by fighting the existing reality to change something you create a new reality that makes the existing obsolete rather than going into it as it is. Has possibly been put across the mic a lot, yeah. Yes, I'm um, Anna Kim. I'm a fellow of the Institute of Advanced Studies in Culture in the US and uh, directed by uh, the person who wrote on the culture wars. So I want to follow up because I think that uh, when we're talking about um, change, the possibility of change, we're really widening the discussion. Um, beyond what the poll was surveying, which was people's perception about government itself, right? And I think that the findings are somewhat unremarkable in the sense that they fall along party lines, but what's more interesting to me, especially coming from Trump-era America, and I'm afraid that you've suffered some of the detritus of that wake, um, 
with Boris and Brexit is really the absence of any kind of rational space for discourse for politics, which has completely been subsumed by the media and spectacle. Yeah. That's why I appreciate forums such as this. Um, but uh, that loss of a rational space of discourse has led to an attenuation of any sense of agency to participate in a democratic process that could change parliament or any other kind of government. So um, I think really that is the question, is whether people feel any form of agency to be part of a liberal democracy. The one thing, the one thing I should just say, and I don't know if you had a chance to read, but Peter Kellner, who helped us craft the poll, if you read the piece that he produced today, and there, there are a bunch of different things that he's going to be writing for us, but just today, the thing that struck me that I found a little shocking was the realization that if you just did the calculation on the number of people who supported the proposition, as Joe was talking about, about strong leaders, we're much closer to the states than we like to think. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yes, no, you are. That's why yeah. I said I'm uh, but, sorry. But, I'm no, sorry. but, <laughs> but, it's, but I, I guess know, my the point. The year of strongman politics was, yeah, I mean, Trump, Putin, Hungary, everywhere. I mean, yeah, we the, are in the era of strongman politics. Yeah. Well, I'm going to I'm going to come in a moment. To some people put their hands up and say, right, they're going to consign their best friends to a, <laughs> a life in the tea rooms. But actually, I wanted to ask you first because I think you put your hand up, say you would advise your best friend not to go anywhere. All right, I don't know your politics, actually, but I was rather hoping you might become an MP. <laughs> so tell me why you're telling your best friend not to, and whether or not you sort of take John's line that we're going to have to build a politics outside of the existing structures. Yeah, I was very uh, interested in that, and I, I want to learn more about the Taiwan example. So I'm, I'm Hashi Mohammed. I'm, my day job is a, uh, I'm a barrister, and I'm also uh, working with Tortoise on a number of things, and I recently wrote a book about social mobility called People Like Us, what it takes to make it in modern Britain, and I sort of dissected the analysis of what the sort of social inequalities and issues are in this country. For me, I look at this period of time, and I'm re just reflecting on the point about the strongman. What's really fascinating about the period we're going through at the moment is, as somebody who wasn't born then, but if you study Britain's history during the 1970s, and we lead up to the sort of winter of discontent and, discontent and 1979, and how Britain was in real difficulties, it turned out that a strong woman came out of that, who then did what she did, and we know what the history that that led to. So I was really interested to know to what extent there's that feeling that's happening at the moment. But just then reflecting on the wider picture and then coming to why I wouldn't advise anyone to do it, we are, I think, going through a period at the moment of a real feeling of hopelessness in many people's lives, a lack of control, when the Bank of England governor says that he can't do anything to protect people from the cost of living, when the Chancellor of the Exchequer says that there's only so much the government can do, the intergenerational divide, I'm a barrister practicing in planning law, housing is the biggest issue of our time, and no one, but no one has any idea to how to tackle it properly. I feel like we're going through a period of time where most of our politicians, if not all of our politicians, are completely bankrupt of any ideas, any real ideas that could work. They come up with stupid slogans like the leveling up agenda and the leveling up plan. And, and so for me, it's a sort of a real crisis moment that's come together that has led to sort of almost caricature situations where Boris Johnson is fighting a no confidence vote and you've got people like Jacob Rees-Mogg and Nadine Doris supporting him. It's just so weird and surreal. But actually, can I, can I, can I put to you, this, this is about as insulting a thing as I can possibly sure. say to you, but I think, I think you want to have your cake and eat it. Okay. I think you want to defend the institutions of liberalism, right? Institutions like parliament and representative well, democracy. I was going to come to that, because I actually don't think our parliamentary system is, any, is, is, is worth anything anymore. I actually think that our parliamentary system, as it currently stands, is completely devoid of attacking the issues that we face today. So, do you, you, so do you have some sympathy with I those, those that, huge, that 31% no, no, of people? I have huge sympathy with the fact that we need to find something from the outside. 
If you think about how you have to play the politics games within the Labour Party to even get a selection, then when you get in there, you have to do this stupid thing of towing the line and you can't even actually think for yourself. Then you get into cabinet and you're on the money and you're getting paid and you basically don't know what to say or what to think. When you think about the way that they vote on some of this stuff, it's completely arcane. We definitely want to preserve some sort of democratic processes. Don't get me wrong. We need people to have the credibility and the sort of legitimacy from the people. But our democratic processes and the way in which our parliament is currently structured and the poor quality of MPs that we've got right now means that the system is just not fit for purpose at all. So if you're telling me why are you not going into politics, I'm thinking to myself, when I stand up in court and I'm in front of a judge and I look at my opponent, the one thing I'm thinking to myself is this judge is going to ask me a question and he's going to ask him a question and the person who's going to win is who comes up with the best answer and I better be ready because I will be skewered if I say something stupid. Now you tell me how many politicians go into parliament thinking that. <laughs> how many politicians stand up in the media thinking, do I really want to say this stupid thing? No. They all think, just repeat, repeat, repeat. So you tell me what is the purpose of that I, I guess, actually, the, the reason, I, I suppose, uh, I tell you why I'm sort of fumbling on this, because I think that a room like this is probably mostly horrified by Joe's point about the strong leader, right? But actually, deep down, what we're saying is there's quite a lot of sympathy for the view that Parliament is either obstructing real big change policy progress, but at the same time, I'm not sure that you want a strong leader that's unchecked. We do not want a situation where we have some sort of a strong leader who decides what they want to do when they wake up without some sort of checks and balances. So, Hence so why we definitely do need a, strong, a leader who is decisive, who has ideas, who wants to implement those ideas, and a parliament that says, we will help you do the best that we can to make those ideas work. What we don't want is a leader who can press a button and then make everything happen. But the reality is, if you see somebody like Boris Johnson, who has nothing to give to this nation, nothing whatsoever, sitting there, and the only way he survives is because the cabinet that he's put together is on his payroll. Is that really the modern nation that we need right now, at a time when people are living beyond that, you know, in a way that they're living way below the, the poverty line, where we are going through a huge crisis that is only going to get worse as we go along. The last thing I will say is this. When you think about the strong leader mentality, for me, I completely do not want a situation where we just have one person making decisions. But at the moment, tell me one thing. I, I ask anyone here, tell me the last time you saw a politician of any stripe go up and say, this is what I think, and this is how I have thought about it. I may be wrong, but come with me on this journey and let me try, because nobody else has any other ideas that are better than this. And the only time that we've done that, it seems, is like, for example, stupid things like this Rwanda plan. That's the only time they come up with something that they turn around and go, no one else has any other ideas. And that's really, you know, that's just politics. And also, by the way, if you listen to Hashi's podcast next week, you'll also discover untrue. On Tortoise, untrue. it's coming untrue. out. Untrue. Exactly. <laughs> Amazing. Um, I, I'm going to come back. Sorry, Hashi, I could I, keep I, going. I'm going to no, stop. No, 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 we definitely want to keep going. I, I want to... Sorry, I'm going to come to you. I'm, well, I'm going to come to you in a moment, but I'm going to come to you, so then I'm going to come front off to Alex next to you. So, so what's just your name? Yeah. Uh, I'm Seth. I'm from the Sheila McKetney Foundation. Thank you for hosting our awards last week. So, obviously, we're interested in campaigning and the space that is available for campaigners to make change. Um, and I just wonder... First of all, I'm quite interested in what the working definition of democracy was that these people were kind of at test against, and do we know what they were talking about when they think of democracy? Um, but secondly, the space that is afforded to people campaigning everyday life, do we know anything about how they feel about how powerful they are in this system and what civil society's role is in shaping uh, society? Do you want, Joe, do you want to just mention the one in and five? Also, sorry, that's, that's sorry, nothing going, to do yeah. with your question. My best mate's an idiot. He'd be an awful MP. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a, the, 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 just I know whether Joe's at hand, but there's the, one of the findings that I found most... So I found the same finding as Joe most shocking, but the other one I found most shocking was that one in five people think that they have any meaningful say in how the country is run. Four in five, in effect, think that... And... and, and two to one, we think it doesn't make any difference which party 
is in power. I mean, there's some really, I mean, that's why it's really complicated. But the reason I want to come to Alex, if you don't mind, so Alex and I used to work together at the BBC. So Alex, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. But I think we, you, I think you raised your hand to advise your best friend, who I'm hoping yeah. is not the same person as Seth's best friend, yeah. <laughs> to the, that you would advise him to be, or her, to be a, the, an MP. Yes. Because? Because, um, so when I get to it, I mean, I did used to work at the BBC and I was a civil servant uh, and I work for BT. So I suppose maybe I'm biased towards thinking that you know, institutions can be good things and can be changed from within. But I think the, the reason I answer positively to your question is I think I'm, I'm too impatient to wait for yeah. very organic sort of Athenian style or hackathon style sort of change to emerge because there are so many things that need fixing. Uh, and some of those things absolutely are the institutions themselves, but they're not sort of amorphous sort of entities of their own uh, existing in their own kind of free floating way they are composed of people and you want good people and you know grown ups uh, with serious ideas populating as institutions and able to do something to wrestle them and achieve real change both making them work better and fixing the sort of massive problems we've got to tackle whether it's housing whether it's net zero whether it's the you know, future of our public services um, I'm not sort of happy to sort of wait around and uh, take a more apocalyptic view that says oh, it's sort of, sort of it's so terrible and eventually it will kind of crumble that feels to me more in the sort of almost in the sort of slightly dominic cummings almost sort of sort of territory of creative destruction and i'm a more more a kind of builder and a fixer I and, think. What, and what do you say to those people who say look i understand that and who are kind of in effect not that supportive of sort of john's let's do things fundamentally differently or hashes but say as, as long as you support the current institutional setup, you're essentially siding with a long process of decline in the UK, both as a society and as a democracy. Yeah, and it's certainly true. I think we need to challenge some of the sort of things that we hold, have held dear and sort of thought of as sort of British exceptionalism wrongly, I would say, because you just have to look back at the last five years to see that perhaps the things that we told the world we were sort of, we had invented or better at are kind of genuinely quite questionable um, and we probably do need better rules and different ways of enshrining big principles about how things like the civil service or the judiciary yeah. or the kind of you know ministerial code operates so they all need fixing um, but for example but just on that Alex would you personally not in any of the kind of institutional capacities you've lived in but would you personally want to see a written constitution uh, now I probably would say yeah, I've either written constitution or a constitutional act that uh, is much more specific about how some of the things work that traditionally we have kind of you know mixed and matched our way along I mean I think the one thing which is different now to compare to when I was a, a sort of you know baby civil servant uh, even back then lots of people used to say all, all politicians are the same they're all kind of hopeless and useless little sort of things that Hash was just saying and, and mostly speaking I would defend actually the, the sort of capability and at least the intent, the sort of honourability of lots of politicians on both sides because I would see them up close and, and believe that they're a lot better than the popular sense of them and it, it's fair to say I don't spend as much time now necessarily defending all of them as a class but I think it's wrong to lump them all together and say they are all in the same boat here. Yeah, because I've, I've got Nigel Quinton here by the way in the chat saying what about Rory Stewart and we just had Jesse Norman in what who's... Pardon? Yeah, look what happened to him. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> but, you know, Jesse Norman was just in doing our Slow Politics podcast. I'm, I'm going to come back to this. I also just want to give everyone fair warning that in the sort of second half, which is we're just coming into the second half, I would really love to hear any thoughts or ideas on mends, anything that you think would be a meaningful mend. I know John's cheated because he's written a whole book on it, but anyone who's got thoughts, I'll come to you, John, too, as well, I'd love to hear. But I want to bring Will in because Seth's point that sort of gets to the one of the sort of really interesting elements of the whole democracy poll that we've done which is actually a lot of this is driven by inequality the the the, the things that people think of as freedoms and that we might think count in principle don't seem to count much in practice and by contrast it seems will life in practice really has an impact on politics in principle so i just wondered what your read of it all is so, yeah, so my name is Will Snell. I'm the chief exec of the Fairness Foundation, which you've probably never heard of because we're all about six months old. Um, but our objective is to try and make fairness or examine how fairness can be made into a sort of organizing principle for a, a good society in the UK. And, you know, we know it's hardwired into everyone 
from birth, uh, and yet people talk past each other because people have different definitions of fairness. So what we're trying to do is to say, can we come up with a kind of overarching definition of what fairness looks like, which has different components around opportunity and treatment and reward and so on. Uh, and then obviously making sure that the public support that. And we've just done some polling, although with a slightly smaller sample size, uh, that suggests that they do. Uh, and then to look at, OK, what does that mean in terms of the solutions? And so I wanted to talk a bit about the relationship between fairness, economic inequality in particular, and then political inequality. And you're just taking three of the findings from the poll to sort of structure that a bit. So yeah, this first off, this 30% thinking that we need a strong leader. You know, it does feel to me that democracy and fairness are deeply intertwined. You know, and that the degree of economic inequality that we have in this country, uh, and the fact that that is removing people's opportunities to make the most of their lives, is something that you know is is deeply damaging to our sense of capacity and our belief in democracy. And it feels like that's that's a key part of you know, why um, people are often pushed towards populism. Uh, and at the same time, you know, healthy democracy is important for building a fair society. So there's a bit of a yin and yang circle there. And then secondly, around the six in 10, you know, this idea that rich and, rich and powerful people have more political influence than ordinary voters. This idea that, you know, okay, there's, the, there's a whole set of issues around, you know, PR and, and you know, gerrymandering and whatever else. But actually that there is a, a really fundamental point about people's belief that economic inequality does translate into different um, self-esteem, different amounts of agency, different uh, amounts of ability to, to influence decisions, both in terms of people becoming disengaged at the bottom end and also you know, the perception and the reality that those at the top do have a, an undue influence. And it feels to me that that's you know, it's a really important problem, both in terms of the perception and the reality. Uh, and then finally, this a point around two thirds of people saying, uh, people in cities have more advantages than those in towns and villages and similar margins around um, men more than women, southerners more than northerners, graduate more than non-grads, et cetera. Uh, you know, again, this widespread belief that we don't have a quality of opportunity and, and our, our findings and those of many other surveys is that what really pisses people off is not the lack of necessarily um, inequality, it's, it's unfair inequalities. Mm -hmm. Um, and we did some polling that said, you know, if you had three political parties to choose from, one that promotes equal outcomes in, in, to a degree that, you know, no one is arguing for, uh, one that promotes a small state in the market leading it, and one that promotes the reduction of inequality to the point where you have equal opportunities. And we found that a majority of people went for option three in, across all breakdowns, including conservative voters. The, the only thing will I put against I'm, I'm just going to ask, some people have read in the weeds of our findings, but let's assume that not everyone has. I, I just could just challenge that on one point. One of the findings is around, we looked at, was the generation gap. So not just we looked at geography gaps, we looked at economy gaps, but the generation gap. And we put to people, I think I'm going to get the wording of this right-ish, Joe, which was, do you agree with the idea that older people get a lot and younger people get less, and it should be the case that older people get a little less from government and younger people get a little more, right? Older people get a little less, younger people get a little more. Over 65, people over 65, what do you think was the level of opposition to that idea? Two to one, three to one, four to one, Five to one, six to one, <laughs> seven to one. Over 65, seven to one against the proposition that older people should get a little less and younger people should get a little more. And, and there, is a, there is a democracy problem in that. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I think there's a problem that, you know, one in three in the population think everything is hunky dory. Yes. You know, and that is the group who are basically holding this government and other parties to ransom. Yep. You know, it's, it's the wealthy older homeowners, yep. basically, coming back to Hashi's point about housing. Yep. Um, you know, and, and the challenge is to convince them that it's in their interests and society's interests and their children and grandchildren's interests to sort that out. Can I just want on that point, one of the things that I've always been struck about, the intergenerational lack of solidarity, was, and again, you don't want to generalized, but I remember living in France in 2005, 2000, between 2005 and 2007, 
And it was during that time when they were burning cars and Sarkozy was proposing a law that would only apply to people who just got into work. And the law was saying to employers, you need to take on more young people and we're going to make it easier for you to take on young people because in the first two years of hiring them, you could fire them without a reason. People were up in arms and out on the streets. And I remember, I'm 19 years old, and I remember talking to people who were really old in the streets where we were marching and saying to them, this law doesn't even affect you. Why are you even here in the rain? Mm -hmm. And they were like, well, I don't want my son to be victimized by a legislation that's going to mean that they're not getting what I get. And, and I remember that dawning on me. Fast forward 20 years, I'm at a planning inquiry for housing, 300 houses, and there are probably about 60 people turning up every morning to oppose that development from happening. I look at that crowd, no offense, all I see is silver hair. <laughs> silver hair of people who are all homeowners, who all bought their houses for relatively cheap prices, all saying no. And I say to them all the time, where is your son? Oh, he's living in the, back, in the bedroom. How old is he? 25 years old. I mean, how do you not understand this? How do you not understand this? So the intergenerational solidarity for me, mm -hmm. I found really stark in Britain mm -hmm. compared to other countries. The lack of it. The lack of, yeah. the lack of intergenerational solidarity. Can I, Polly, can I just put you on the spot, if I don't mind? So, so Polly Curtis was one of the founding editors at Ponce here at Tortoise, and you'd done this before we'd done it, right? So you had done it, um, taken the newsroom on the road, gone to Birmingham, tried to understand, get kind of citizen voices that informed what we did. Then we did a number of things on, on public policy, on families, but also on politics. And I just wondered whether, how do these processes run aground? Why is it that we always try and think about democracy and don't necessarily come up with anything constructive as a result of it? Like, uh, when, when, sort of being both on the inside and outside mm. of what we do now, what would be your <clears throat> kind of unvarnished advice on what we do next? Change is hard and the incentives aren't there to make change possible. I think the starting point for the project is um, a, what you want democracy to achieve and what people will expect from democracy. And Joe, there was a, a bit in the poll that really stuck in my mind from the podcast about people's expectations of their MP being their delegate or to represent them. So are they there as a transactional, mm. um, I'm going to go to Parliament and do your bidding, or are they there to make really sensible choices? Because policy and the inter intergenerational decisions, all of those things are, are about compromise and about making difficult choices. And how do we articulate that to people and bring people through that process? And, you know, there'll be lots of people, John will talk much more to things like deliberative democracy and how you can put structures in place for those things. But I think there's something very cultural here. We're at a point where we think politics is a transaction. I vote for you, you're going to do that for me. Not I vote for you because I believe in the way you think and the priorities you have and you're going to do a better job for the country. And I think, I think we can talk about the rules and the structure and all of those things. There's a cultural conversation and it needs to be had around that, mm. about the expectations of what democracy is. I'm, and I'm coming to you in a moment. I'm coming to. So you have your hand up there, Seb. Have you got a mic? Thanks. Run that. Yeah, yeah. Do, yeah. Find that too, and then I'll come to you in a second. Yeah. The, uh, the results were that fewer than a third, 31% of people, said that MPs should stick to their principles and support the policies they think are in the public interest, even if most of their constituents hold a different view. And more than half, 55% thought that MPs should vote according to the wishes of the majority of their constituents, even if it means voting against policies that they think are in the public interest. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name's Dara. Um, I'm a management consultant for my sins. Um, but I think that point you just made about your cultural conversation is, is actually really fundamental and maybe even foundational, because to Hashi and Joe's point, maybe the question we need to be asking is about how do we actually define democratic behavior? Is it the behavior that democracy is naturally like, 
or is it the, the behavior that would preserve a democracy? So by that, just because I think people always assume that they're the same thing, but the, demo the behavior that a democracy would like, you know, thinking about your own interests, you know, being really sort of um, self-focused or inwardly focused, isn't going to necessarily preserve it. That, you know, if you want to preserve the democracy, there has to be that compromise, there has to be that sacrifice. So maybe a, a better example is with the nobility. So the behavior that a nobleman in like the medieval times would prefer is like, you know, pillaging, raping the, the maidens, mm -hmm. or prima nocca, I think, the, the first wedding night for him. But that's not the behavior that would preserve nobility because that's going to start a peasant's revolt. Yeah. So it's that same sort of thinking that maybe we need to do for democracy, that the behavior that we'd all naturally like, you know, rampant free speech without, you know, questions about its validity versus constraining that a little bit to preserve democracy. You know, maybe we need to just go back to first principles. But if, but if you take that, Jonathan, the, 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 the logic of that would be that we, at some level, prescribe responsibilities for citizens as well as rights. We have to. You, you and how would you it. do that? Well, I think, again, we maybe need to have slightly more grown-up conversations about what are the obligations when you have, you know, a passport or a citizenship of any country. And I think we almost got to that point with the Shamima Begum uh, discussion when she was stripped of her citizenship. And yeah. people began to ask, OK, what, what would qualify you to get to that point where your, your citizenship is ripped away? What responsibilities must you always meet to keep it? Because we then started to realize, oh, maybe this isn't quite automatic, even if you're born here. Um, and again, I'm, I'm still, you know, I'm not sure they should have stripped Poor Shamima, no, um, you know, shouldn't. because it, yeah. that that's, you know, that just didn't sit well with me. But um, I think the conversation that it was starting to prompt was an interesting one because we finally got to this place of starting to think, as a citizen, you have obligations to the country that you're a citizen of. Yes. Although in that case, it was also tiered rights, wasn't it? Sorry, Annie wants to say something and then. Oh, hi, Mark. <laughs> I've been talking for a long time. Oh, sorry, Anna, go ahead. Okay, just, we, we just, just, just you very say, quickly to follow yeah. up on these two, and I think it's related. It's just to. I just wanted to insert into the conversation um, something which I think is very implicit, which is um, the shaping force of neoliberalism and <coughs> capitalism. I mean, you spoke of the way that um, people's perceptions of politics has been reduced to a kind of transaction. And I think, you know, the failure of imagination of intergenerational solidarity um, say between, you know, in Britain and the US as compared to France is because France has an experience of socialism, right? And so I think that it's very difficult both in the US and in Britain to imagine, just as it's, there's a kind of a parallel to the difficulty in imagining a post-capitalist future. I mean, we all try, right? We all try to get out of the structure to think about, you know, what could that look like? It's also very difficult to imagine what sort of a post neoliberal democratic system mm. would look like and how we would affect that from the outside without it, you know, just sort of, you know, without revolution or, so I'd be interested to hear from the outside, you know, how that change could yeah. occur because I think it's, it's very difficult. It's, it's very yeah. difficult. Uh, you asked about us to come up with oh, mending. Yeah. What's the mend? So my name's Alex Coley. I'm a local borough councillor in Epsom and Yule which has the distinction of being independently controlled since 1937. So we haven't had political parties running our council for 85 years. The only council that's been um, run longer as independence is the Corporation of London, which is independent by statute. So I've got a, a very different opinion about politics. And uh, I've, I've put some notes down because I want to get it structured for you. Um, what do you mean by democracy? Broadly speaking, there are eight levels of government, right the way down to town and parish councils. So we're talking a lot about <clears throat> Parliament and the Prime Minister, but there's more to government than just Whitehall. Now, there's an emeritus professor called Colin Copus who writes a lot about local government and local democracy and representation. And he would say, as he said to me, the level of representation in this country is the worst in Europe. So, Too for high. example, uh, so we maybe four or five thousand per politician, if you like, a, a kind of a, generally speaking, at a local level. In France, about 120 people per representative, which is the other end of the spectrum. But if you look at Germany, Italy, Spain, the Netherlands, they're all, you, your access to your representative, the level at which you are represented is way, way higher than in here, which is the worst in Europe. So I also want to say that unitary devolution, which is something that uh, Robert Jenrick, who was the uh, minister for 
Communities Housing and Local Government uh, prior to Michael Gove was very big on devolution and wanted to see uh, what the government said was power being devolved out to a lower level. But it's worth noticing that that is only one level away from Whitehall. That's counties, so that's not any further down. It's one order of magnitude and it hugely benefits the big parties. Conservative and Labour both massively support that level of county deal, if you like, so that you... With as well, right? Indeed. Well, you'll see the Bristol Mayor is now being rescinded as a, as a thing, as an entity. So the idea that, for example, the County Council network is exclusively controlled by Conservatives, that there are no other parties that, that are on the CCN. Um, I'm an LGA board member, so they'll thank me for that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just important to know that, that devolution, as it's being described in this country, it isn't devolution. It, it's not really taking it very far away from the centre at all. Um, and I just wanted to say that my solution, which came to me from uh, a, a friend and former colleague, Paul Clark, who's a prolific government watcher, used to be, uh, you, you know Paul, I'm sure, uh, used to be a civil servant, prolific political photographer and great um, bon viveur. He said something on Twitter that immediately caught my eye. He said, all local councillors should be independent. Now, of course, that appeals to me. But what would that mean for politics if there was no greasy poll, there were no back-scratching favours, that you couldn't be a political party member if you're a local councillor? How much would that separate that favour and patronage and payroll approach to government if you were not allowed, as you are in the Corporation of London, not allowed to be a political party councillor? So that's my solution. Interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah I, I was just going to respond to that. Um, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm always interested in, and I'll come back to my sort of small area, which is planning law, and people always joke planning is politics. Because when you go to a local council, local members will vote on that particular planning application for a scheme. I'm on planning. Uh, sorry? I'm on planning. You're on the planning committee. So what you will see on the planning committee is oftentimes a huge amount of debate, but quite frankly, up and down the country, the vast majority of councillors will think, if I vote through this housing, am I going to be re-elected? Very, very few times do you see someone thinking, we need more housing because we don't have enough houses. They always think, if I vote this through, am I going to lose in the next local election? And what that has resulted in, interestingly, you talking about independent councils, what that has resulted in up and down the country is hung local authorities. Because what's happened is people are now not drawing alliances along blue and red or yellow colours that we know about, but actually anti-development coalitions. Anti-housing coalitions is what we are seeing. So the question you asked about what kind of democracy we are. We are apparently a representative democracy. I'm going into Parliament to represent the interests of the local people based on what these local community need. Not based on whether or not you think no, no housing should come forward. Not based on whether or not you think that if you allow this housing to come through, you won't get elected the next time. And for me, that's what I'm interested in. And I, what I talk about in my forthcoming book about housing and, and the housing crisis, one of the things I talk about is, until we get local councillors who are ready to vote for schemes based on what's the right thing to do and be prepared to be voted out on that basis, we're never gonna crack this nut. We're never gonna crack this nut. There, there is, I mean, there is one, one, one thing to say, say on this, is that in the pandemic, it's really nice to see you again, Alex, and, and so I'm saying that partly because Alex came to loads of our thinking to when we got started, and like some people, we haven't kind of, kind of been back in the newsroom for a while, but, but I think everyone's gone through some changes in the course of the last couple of years, not least in the way they think, and one of the things that I feel embarrassed about, amongst many others, is the extent to which I thought of politics as an extension of the history department, right, that historians frame thinking about politics and wishing now that it was framed by geographers and the geography department because i don't know about you but my experience of the pandemic was it really mattered where you were and what defined where you were so often was 
public services, local government, and it seems to me so uneven, so uneven our system of local government, I can't quite wrap my head around it. Um, I'm going to do one thing, and speaking of where you are. Pardon? And your internet and your connection. connection. Well, speaking of which, I'm now going to make another epic fail on this, uh, this thinking, which is to fail to get to all the people who are online have got their hands up. I'd like, can I just bring in, um, George, will you just see if we can bring in uh, Yasmin, who is good, Got thought, I think Paul has got his hand up, and somewhere there is the mighty well, and Nico's got his hand up, and the great Matt Dancona's there. Yes, man, how are you doing? Hi, folks. I, um, I've got COVID, so hopefully what I say makes sense. But, um, can you can hear me all right? Yeah, yeah far away, far <clears throat> away. Yeah. Um, so I think one of the, the first thing that maybe I, I sort of brought to the conversation, and thank you for whoever it was that brought up neoliberalism, because I think that sort of the individualizing of the way that we think about politics is something that has been happening for the last 30 years, or the last, you could say, 40, 50 years that I think we haven't totally accounted for when we think about um, collective movements going forward. But one of the things in the conversation about institutions that I wanted to bring up was that I think we sort of use the word institutions quite broadly and sweepingly. And I tend to do this myself and say, we need to sort of change institutions or dismantle them or whatever. But any functional society needs institutions, right? It, it, the question is, what are those institutions? What values are they based on? What are the foundations of the institutions that we currently have? Are they still fit for purpose and so on? Because I think often what the way that change most sustainably happens is when you change when you create an alternative institution alongside another one and say this does the work of this particular one but better and so let's replace this one with this alternative one so you kind of because I think when you have a power vacuum I mean my family left Sudan because of a, a vacuum of institution and it continues to not really work out well for Sudan so I'm not somebody who sort of is a fan of anarchy full stop but thinks that when we we need to make sure that we don't just sort of look at the 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 scaffolding and the structure and say none of it all works but also to sort of say well we have to go inside and renovate it but to think about you know what are the values underpinning the institutions, and also if they have changed and warped over time, when how do we maintain? How do we create processes so that we continue to update them? Because it might be that it worked fifty years ago, but it's not fit for purpose today. So how we fail to create a process so that it continues to be fit for purpose? Okay. Just something to add. We well, this gets to the kind of the cultural debate question that I think Paul, uh, Paul and Darrell were mentioning. Paul. Mute. Okay. <clears throat> uh, right. I'm going to give you a mend. <clears throat> um, a big picture, briefly, is in 1649, Parliament cut the head off a king after some false starts that, that then produced constitutional monarchy, a monarch in Parliament with two houses of Parliament. Democracy came much later. We've really only had democracy since, uh, what, 1930, when all women got the vote. Um, in the process of setting up democracy, we've turned the monarch into a figurehead. We've more or less made the House of Lords wholly decorative. The House of Lords is no longer the Supreme Court. That's been separated off. We're left with the House of Commons, and the House of Commons has many functions. It's the, it's the executive, it's the opposition, it's the legislature, and it's a scrutiny body. And given all that, it does those things surprisingly well. And it's a simple system because people have one vote and that, that, that gives it all of them. But I think that system now is really buckling for, for a lot of reasons. But two key things, twice in the last 10 years, a prime minister has changed the constitution to suit himself or yes, himself in both cases. Um, and where, where Boris is, you know, which no one really noticed, but as far as I can see, even if he lost a vote of confidence, he wouldn't have to resign. There's no legal obligation on him to do so. Mm. Um, the, um, uh, and the most influential political movement in the last decade has been um, UKIP, which never had representation in the House, only ever had one MP in the House of Commons, I think two at one point. Okay. So the, the system is now wide open to be gained. Um, and I take all the rest of your really great points about local democracy. I've been chair of a parish council and, you know, all that stuff that that needs to come into it. But key thing is the system is 
is broke. OK, my mend, which I kind of floated in 2019 and was part of the first, well, pre-COVID rounds of these discussions, take the House of Lords, do what basically the Labour Party proposal to make it um, uh, elected on multi-member constituencies with, with proportional representation, regions and nations. But you've got to decide what you want to do with it. The House of Commons is de desperately jealous of its sovereignty. I would say make an elected upper house, give that the executive role. Executive house, upper house appoints the prime minister. The commons in a smaller form can then be legislature and scrutiny body. Um, and that will then actually get rid of, a, a, you know, that will open up the system a lot more. It needs to be opened up. We, we, our system now is open to gaming. It doesn't produce competent government system at a local level is controlled by handfuls of people um that's that's my mend Paul, okay great not a small one i thought it was you know, when you introduced it it was like i've got a mend turns out <laughs> it's a fundamental rewriting the british constitution by capital parliament but i love it i love it i'm all in i'm going to just make sure i just want to make sure i'm really aware of the time and we're running towards the end of time but i do want to hear from matt because matt's worked quite a fair bit with peter and with lara and with the gang on this and, and matt, I, I wonder where where you are on it uh well so much i could say about conscious of time um uh, I'll just rattle through a few thoughts. Um, uh, I think there are some low-hanging fruit, is the good news. I think that one thing that came out of um, the poll is that a big problem is that MPs are held in low regard. And there's a low-hanging fruit in that the Nolan report in 1995, which set up all the anti-sleaze structures, is actually an unfinished revolution. And we haven't got in place a proper sanction system that really does lead to MPs being really punished properly and ministers when they do wrong. Uh, uh, we've seen a backward step recently with um, Johnson watering down the ministerial code. What we should do is put the ministerial code on a statutory footing, beef up the independent advisor's office and give the independent advisor the right to initiate um, investigations. I mean, it's it's not a panacea, but that's a, that's a, that's a doable thing. Second thing, other end of the scale, we need to massively um, proliferate digital access uh, and I don't just mean that in the kind of um, bland means. I, I mean getting a tablet or a smartphone or a laptop into the hand of every single citizen free of charge and with um, ways of teaching them meaningfully how to use it because all politics is digital politics now. All public services are digital. Not being able to handle this equipment gives you a, a massive, um, you know, it puts you at a massive, massive disadvantage. It means that you don't even know what the rules are, let alone, you know, your rights to uh, follow them. The third thing I think, we, I, the, the more I look at this, the more I think less in terms of institutions and more in terms of elites. The thing that has, that scares me, if I'm honest, and I think the finding about how many people are attracted to the idea of the strong leader is how little the elites have learned since 2016. They, if they're honest, they see Trump and Brexit as an aberration. And they expect at some point the populations of the world to turn up at New York and in Washington and in Davos and say, sorry, and ask for them all back. Those days are over. What's terrifying about the, the, the way that the world is still run by elite management is the, the compositions of the elites change, but the operations, the culture, the self-satisfaction, the, the way that big business, government and media govern the world in coalition hasn't changed at all. And I think that if you're looking at the way that a society organizes itself around rules, you have to be painfully honest about that. And it's really hard because you know, you're asking people who've aggregated power over centuries to, to look at themselves and to, to look at the future of their children and so on. But I, I think that you know, just making, just looking at single transferable votes and local devolution and all of that sort of stuff, excellent though it may be, only gets you to starting blocks. I think I totally agree with Polly about culture. Culture is where this starts. Thank, Matt, thank you. I am, I'm sorry, Nico, I'm going to, I'm going to try and make sure that we close on time so that we've got some time also to sort of talk more casually and more kind of personally here and please stick around online if you're chatting, but I'm going to try and keep to time, which as everyone knows is not my greatest strength. <clears throat> I just want to tell people what we're trying to do so you've got a sense that it's starting, it's not ending. 
On a personal note, I was completely fascinated by what happened in Australia with the Teal Independence, with that group of 20 people who didn't join a party, who did get backing against three ideas, political reform, climate action and fiscal conservatism, in their case. But the thing that I thought was really interesting was if you wanted to back a group of disruptive independent MPs targeted at marginal constituencies in the UK, and one of your key platform elements was political reform, what would be in it? If that was the ultimate exam question, what would be in it? And in our own way, John, that's actually what we're hoping to do. I've got, we've all got issues about how you crowdsource it, and I'm sure we're going to have a conversation about that in probably about 90 seconds. But <laughs> what, I, what, what, I, what I wanted to say is we've got, we think now, the first step right, in having this conversation, which is thanks to Joe and Peter and Lara and Matt and a group of others, I think we've got a bunch of information that's really, really important because the risk is that a bunch... You know, the people, frankly, like me in Fitzrovia are sitting around saying we've got a problem in democracy and it's a whinge, right? It's not a whinge. It's a finding. There's real evidence we've got some really big structural problems and I think your point, Joe, at the beginning, which is it can get a lot worse from here, is something that I think that we really got to take, take on board. So our first step is let's get the information together and understand it better. Our hope is that we run a series of these, big and small, so we can do some which are much bigger, and I think we're also going to try and do some which are much smaller, and then collate as much as we can in terms of information and ideas, right? There's a third step, which is a filtering bit, which no one's going to like, which is you've got to actually choose some things that you would then get behind in platform ideas, and that, I think, will actually separate off people. people will, some, some people will support some ideas, even within our own newsroom, let alone within our own members. But our hope is that in the course of the next four weeks we go to our democracy summit, so we've got another one of these events on the weekend at the Kite Festival, we have another uh, thinking on this democracy question in a couple of weeks after that. We're then going to do a number of these thinkings on the road. I'd really like to get us to a position in the autumn, i.e. on the other side of party conferences, where we begin to think, look, here's what we think a political reform agenda would look like. And the reason I should say that I'm really optimistic, opt optimistic about this and energised by it is that we are in really, really deep trouble as a country and our political classes have run out of ideas. And they know it, right? They're all telling you that. They're saying we're exhausted, right? So there's room for people who are not necessarily in that same swim, I think, to come up with some different ideas and have those taken on. And when I started out as a reporter, someone said to me, look, you know, tabloids can affect the outcome of elections. I'm not sure that's the case anymore, but that was when I started out. But if you like, newsrooms, serious-minded newsrooms, can change policy. And that would be, for us, I think, a really meaningful act. And we hope that by doing this, and thanks to Joe and the Delta Pole team by helping us to begin to get a grip on this subject, we hope we can actually begin to come up with some ideas, some perhaps as big and grand as John's or as Paul's, some of them as direct and uh, uh, meaningful as particular changes, and some of them as profound and cultural as the kind of ones that Darren Polly were talking about. So I hope you'll stick with us. Um, when I say stick with us, I hope you'll stick with us for a drink, right? <laughs> and better than that, longer over the next few weeks and months. I just want to say my email is james at tortoisemedia.com. That's not one of those kind of like round the back emails, that's just to me. If you've got thoughts, we really want to get them. So, Alex, I hope you'll email me the note on your phone. We'd like to then collate it, and we're going to try and figure out a way that we present that as best as possible. There are a whole bunch of us uh, working on this. My colleague Lizzie Lynch is trying to help us bring all of it together, all the voices together. So, you know, do email Lizzie too. And, of course, Matt Dancona is our sort of presiding brain on all things uh, political. So please do help us try and figure this out, and please do stick with us, because we're just starting something and we'd love to have you with us. Um, for this evening, though, will you also give a big thank you to Will, who's helped us think through some of the power gap questions in all of this, for Joe, who's done all the hard work, and for Hashi, who's told it like it is. Thank you very much. Thank you.